I am so pleased today to be here to introduce my good friend and colleague, John San Giovanni. John and I have, I've had the pleasure of working with John for about four years now. Uh, and he's just one of the most creative and insightful and practical uh, math education professionals that I have the pleasure to work with. And um, John, if you don't know, is a mathematics supervisor in Howard County, Maryland. Um, there he leads the mathematics curriculum development, digital learning assessment, and professional development for over 1,500 teachers in 41 schools in the district. He is also an adjunct professor and coordinator of the Elementary Math Instructional Leadership Graduate Program at McDaniel College. Um, you may know of him through his work with NCTM, where he was recently on the board of directors. And of course, he is a very well-known author. Um, John has just published his fourth and fifth book with Corwin Mathematics, which is the topic um, that he'll be talking about today on jumpstart routines. And uh, I know that this um, PD session is going to be well worth your while and that you'll leave here with some great new ideas for a couple of routines and takeaway tips that you can implement in your classrooms tomorrow. So John, take it away. All right. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Hello, folks. Hope you're all having a good day. Um, today we're going to talk about routines for jumpstarting math, uh, number sense and reasoning specifically. My email address is on the screen. I'll put it up again at the end. Uh, my Twitter handle is there as well. Um, you're always welcome to send me a question either way, and I would be uh, happy to talk with you. On that note, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I have some confessions to make. Um, the first is that I, as a classroom teacher, have sabotaged lessons. Um, so if that's not you, this might not be the session for you. I've run out of time during a, during a lesson, and um, um, maybe I have complained about student number since and, and the reasoning once or twice in my career. I, I have sabotaged lessons by, you know, maybe going over homework and then no one uh, did it or number seven on the homework was so hard that it became a mini lesson and I looked up and I had five minutes left of class. Um, sometimes I run out of time when I went over a warm up and the warm up was disconnected or confusing or it turned out to be a mini lesson. And then I had the conversation about what am I going to do? I have so much to teach and now no time left. And all along I felt like number sense was the linchpin and my students' success. And that's where I really want to start with you tonight. Um, think to yourself for just a moment. How, how would you describe a student who has number sense? What makes this student come to mind? Take a moment and think about it. How do you describe a student who has number sense? So I ask that question often. I ask that of the questions I, of the teachers I work with. I ask it of myself. You might have said something about um, they're really good with numbers. That they attack problems. That they know if their numbers are reasonableness or their answers are reasonable. They um, can communicate how they went about the math. They talk about the strategies that they used. Um, they just play with numbers and, and aren't afraid to take chances. Those are just some of the things that makes those students come to mind for me. We have some definitions or descriptions about what number sense is. Number sense is awareness, understanding about what numbers are. Number sense is understanding relationships. Number sense is thinking about the magnitude of numbers and that 80 is sometimes a big number and sometimes it's a small number. Think about the effect of operating on numbers and Mental math and estimation have to be considered when thinking about number sense. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Others talk about mental calculation as a defining characteristic of number sense. Some talk about estimation, judging the relative magnitude, um, thinking about part to whole relationships and problem solving in general. Some other notes are, well, it's a well-organized organized conceptual framework. Um, that is a good one, but my favorite is that students with number sense have an intuitive understanding of numbers. Um, they, they just, they know it, they see it, they see numbers all around them. And tonight I'd like to take some time with you to help us think about what we can do to develop student number sense and reasoning, grades three to eight, but really any grade. And oh, number sense, it's the perfect problem. Uh, I used it and complained about it and 
what do I mean about it being the perfect problem? Well, it's not measured, so it's no assessment item per se, and it's it's not a test. Number sense isn't a specific standard or a unit in my textbook. By that count, it's it's not a it's not a lesson. So when I've complained or been concerned about students not having number sense, no one could counter to me. Well, what are you doing about it? Right? Because there wasn't a specific lesson or activity to address it. So they just don't have any number sense. It's the perfect statement until someone said to me, what are you doing about it? And so tonight I share some ideas of what we've done in our district and in my work to, well, do something about it. Throughout the session tonight, we're gonna actually do some activities relative to number sense. And um, well, let's just dig in. Take a look at the screen. How many people do you think can ride that Ferris wheel at one time? I'm gonna give you a few moments to work on it. We'll come back together in maybe a minute or so. Think to yourself, how many people can ride that at one time? So imagine that we were in a classroom. What I would do is solicit ideas from the group. What are, what are some possible answers, um, solutions, the number of people that could ride that Ferris wheel at one time? And as students shared out their ideas, I'd record them on the whiteboard right behind me. I might hear numbers like 96 or, well, 192. I might hear, hear 200. I might solicit about four, four answers. And then I'd ask students, how are those numbers similar? Well, none of those numbers are four-digit numbers. None of them are greater than 500. I noticed that none of them are less than 50. After that, I might ask students, well, how did you think about it? You might have thought about, hmm, is there a quarter of the Ferris wheel showing? And if so, there's about how many gondolas in that quarter? Yeah, the technical term is gondola. Or do you see a third? Can you see a half of the Ferris wheel? And then how did you use that information to figure out how many gondolas there are on the entire Ferris wheel? Oh, and how many people ride in a Ferris wheel gondola? 27 seems like a really dangerous number, right? Maybe some of you thought about two or four, and how would that influence our solution? Well, if I thought there were two people in a gondola, my final, my final number might be about half of what somebody else would say if there were four in a gondola. I'm guessing nobody thought that nine people would ride in it or seven people. And we'd have a conversation about why multiplying with those numbers may not be as friendly. And if you thought nine, maybe use 10 instead. And so this routine called Picture Perfect is a great way to start class by posing a picture, asking a math question. We'll take a look at a few others. Take a look at the bookcase. I want to know how many books are on the entire case. Well, based on that rectangle, you see that rectangle shows 15 books. So how many on the entire bookcase, all the way down to the end and all five rows? I'll give you a few moments to think about it. So just like the Ferris wheel problem, I might do something like this. What are some solutions you have from the group? And again, we can't turn and talk to each other right now, but I think you get a sense of how this might work. So I'd solicit solutions. I might hear 2,000 or 2,400. 
I might hear 1500 or well, I might even hear 2300. And so I grab a few from the group and ask again, are those numbers reasonable? How do you know? Do you notice that none of those numbers are two digit solutions or seven digit solutions for that matter? And after we think about how those numbers are related, then a quick conversation about how did you think about it? Some of you may have thought that there were 45 books in one section. And so if that's offered, my question would be, how many others thought about 45 books in the section? Did anybody use a number different than 45? Why? And some may talk about 50 because, as you know, 50 might be an easier number to work with. But some of my students didn't realize that they could work with 50. Instead, they thought, well, I have to find an exact answer. But in this case, there's really not going to be an exact answer. Instead, we're trying to think about what's reasonable and why is 50 a good number to work with. Some kids might offer 60 instead. That's fine, too. From there, we might have thought about the number of rows there were in the entire bookcase, or, well, maybe we thought about the number of sections and then multiplied. So I think there's five sections, and five sections of 50 is 250 in a column. From there, I might multiply down the number of columns. Maybe you thought five columns, and we talk about why that's a good number to work with, or, or maybe 10. Why nine might not be a good number to work with when multiplying these uh, to find the total, or, some students may talk about how they found how many were in half of the bookcase and then just double that number. During the discussion, things that I want to lift up with students is what numbers make sense? What numbers are easier to work with? What's a good estimate? And so in this book, Jumpstart Routines, we offer short routines to help kids develop reasonableness, estimation, magnitude, and much more. Um, again, I'm doing it pretty quickly, but I think you get some sense of what it might look like. Here's some other examples. A stadium, a full stadium, holds 65,000 people. So my question is, how many people do you think sit right there? And though we're not going to spend time working on it right now, we would have conversations about how much of the stadium can you see? What seems to be a reasonable number? And when somebody says 50,000 people sit in that section, I'm going to cry a little bit. But then we're going to have a good conversation about why that number is probably not reasonable. And if you're a Steeler fan like me, don't use the Raven Stadium. On that note, let's take a look at some others. Oh, for example, are there more or less than 20 brownies? Well, Mr. S, I can't count them all. Right, that's the idea. And though that may not be a great middle school example, it's perfect for first or second grade. And I guess that's the other point. The routines I share with you tonight are perfect for any grade, depending on how and what questions we ask. I might change it to be a brownie's worth 125 calories. How many calories are on the plate? Now, it's a perfect middle school or upper elementary question. And then you can see the question about the dimensions of, of, the, band of the, the pan that the brownies were, were cooked in. So I guess, or baked in, excuse me. So I guess the idea is this routine called Picture It is an opportunity for kids to see math in their world. And over time, you would ask them to ask questions. Actually, what's the question you might ask? Well, maybe you could ask what fraction of the balloons are red? What fraction of the balloons are green? What ratio of balloons to balloons or this or that? How long are all the strings? How many balloons would it take to fill the screen? What we need our students to do is see math around them, to make sense of math in the world, to determine reasonableness by, well, playing with numbers. How would you count the cans on the shelf? Would you count by ones or sixes or tens? How many can you actually see? If you wanted to grab a sprinkled donut, should you choose the box on the left or the box to the right? How do you know? For my second grade students, I might just ask, how would you count the donuts? And through all of these routines, we ask questions. We have kids thinking and engaged in numbers. So the directions for Picture Perfect is to, well, pose a picture, have students notice the math, reason, and respond. So I keep talking about a routine. What is it? Well, a routine is a brief five to seven minute activity for promoting engagement, reasoning, and discourse. The intention is to reimagine the way we begin math class. Now, I have gone over homework the first few minutes of class and well, it has sabotaged my lesson. I have done warm ups because that spiral review is so important, but it sabotaged my lesson. So the idea is to use that five to seven minutes when kids are most interested, most active, to practice, well, to develop number sense and reasoning. We know that their brains are most engaged the first five to seven, maybe 10 minutes of math class. It seems to me that making sense of, well, homework is probably not the best use of that time. 
Oh, and there's this idea. So Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours and the idea that it takes about 10,000 hours to get good at anything. If you think about having math for, well, an hour a day for 180 days in a full school year, you need about 55 school years to get good at math. I don't think we have that kind of time. But we do have time. Think about this. If you spent just 10 minutes a day on number sense over nine years, K-8, for example, for a full school year, that would be about 16,000 minutes. If you divide that by an hour, well, that'd be 270 minutes dedicated, excuse me, 270 hours or a year and a half of just number sense practice, development and play. If you did it just this year, 10 minutes for, for one year for 180 days is 1,800 minutes. And well, that turns out to be 30 hours of instruction dedicated just to number sense. And you think about 30 hours, that's 30 days of math. That's, that's a lot of time, more than a month for focused instruction on math. And more importantly, number sense, number sense routines. Well, speaking of routines, let's jump into another. So I'm interested to know what is the value of, of the point that the arrow is, is pointing to? I'll give you a moment to think about it and then we'll come back together. So at this point, I'd ask students to turn and talk and share out some of their ideas. I might get something like seven tenths or 75 hundredths. I might then hear eight tenths. And then somebody might say three fourths, at which point I'd ask, how is that related to seven tenths, 75 hundredths and eight tenths? Then how did you do it? How did you figure it out? And so students may share their ideas. Somebody talk about the midpoint being about, well, one. And so there, they thought about the difference or the distance between zero and one and how the arrow related to that. And so that's the beginning of this routine called where is the point? But we're just at the beginning. So after showing that first number line, well, take a look now. What do you think the value of the point is now? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Now, if I was doing a good job in my classroom and I could see you all, I might ask, um, how many people use the same strategy as the first number line? How many use a different strategy? Does anybody have a value between three and four? Does anybody want to share their exact value or their semi-exact value? And so I might get three and one-tenth or three and two-tenths. I might hear three and 35 hundredths, just to get a sense of where, well, where the kids are. And then the question becomes, well, how'd you do it then? How did you use the same strategy? And so students might talk about finding the midpoint of three and five tenths and thinking about how close the arrow was to it. Now, the thing is, if you wait long enough, students will then offer some other ideas. And some students may talk about they notice that the endpoints, well, they're related. Two and five tenths is, well, two and five tenths more than zero, and four and five tenths is two and five tenths more than two. So therefore, because the points are in the same spot, the bottom number line, the value of that point must be two and five tenths more than the original idea. And see, that's the brilliance of number sense. When kids have the opportunity to share and exchange ideas and open others' eyes to the way of, their way of thinking, well, everybody develops better thinking. I know, like me, you've probably tried to tell them that thinking and it doesn't work until they hear from a classmate sometimes. Oh, and another note about these number lines, the first time I did zero and two being the endpoints, they told me you couldn't do that. They're like, Mr. S, number lines have to have you know, zero and one or zero and 10. And so they actually, well, they gained a number line and didn't actually understand the relationships within them. So the routine might look something like this. I shift in points or change it around. And then my next number line has a similar change. In fact, both in points were modified by 10. And so what would that do to our value? And here we have a similar interval. And so how can we use that similar thinking to find the unknown in that last number line. Here's the point. You give students a number line, an open number line with, with a point somewhere on it, and ask them to reason, think 
about how the numbers are related and how that influences the value. And I know that some of you right now are like, oh, I'm not working with decimals and I get it, that's totally fine. So instead, those endpoints could be 25 and 35, or they could be 250 and 350, or, or they could be 25,000 and 35,000. In time, that error might have to move around so we can think about proximity and what have you. And, oh, maybe you work with integers. And if you do, well, you understand the challenges this might present for students because zero could be in the middle of every number line, but it doesn't have to be in the middle of every number line. In fact, I could have integers on both sides or both endpoints. What would that tell me? So this routine called Where's the Point is an opportunity for students to think about how numbers are related and make sense of proximity and those relationships themselves. And if you're feeling brave, fractions are a great opportunity for Where's the Point as well. And those fractions can have endpoints only at zero and one because if they do, students get fractions, well, get the sense that fractions are only parts of one and don't recognize that there are values, fractional values, between five and a half and six and a half or 15 and a half and 16 and a half. One of my favorite things about this routine is that it takes about eight seconds of prep. Um, and that's if you can't draw a straight line. And so a quick line, a couple of endpoints and some values. And from there, you can manipulate um, to all sorts, of, all sorts of endeavors. Where's the point is where you give students number lines with diverse endpoints. You identify the value of a specific location and think about how you can use that to figure out the relationships or the, the, the possible value of that, that given point. So Back to routines. Why? Well, because I want my students to understand the relative size of things, very large and very small numbers. I, I need them to develop operational sense and fluency. I need them to use reasoning. I need them to be problem solvers. I want them to be good at mental mathematics. Paper pencil math for me is not good enough. And routines are the opportunity to do that. Well, when? Five to seven minutes, but no more than eight to 10 minutes seems to make sense. It could be the beginning of a lesson or the end of the lesson. I know that, well, we've given choice and teachers have decided to put it at the end of their lessons and guess what happened? Yeah, they didn't get enough time to get to it. And so it was a lost opportunity. And then the conversation was, well, these aren't working. Well, because we aren't doing them. The start of class is probably the best time to do it. But in a block schedule, you might put it in the middle as a transition between the beginning and the end of the block or something like that. Facilitating a routine works something like this. Students engage mentally right when they come into class. Then they share with partners. The groups share out. The teacher records and facilitates, but tries not to dictate strategies and influence student thinking. It's a think, pair, share type of activity. And though we're on the webinar and I can't uh, do that with you exactly, I think some of the ideas have certainly come through. Now, let me reiterate. The ideas of developmental math, and so these are typically not journaling activities and whiteboard activities, but just like everything, we have to use our best judgment and think about the students that we're working with and what tools they need. And so it could be a journal and discuss and chart opportunity as well. So again, five to 10 minutes, about two minutes for them to think, about one minute for them to talk, because after that, it's a conversation about football or what they're doing this weekend. <laughs> and from there, about three to five minutes um, for the class to discuss. And again, if it goes over a minute, I'm okay with that because, well, it's a worthwhile activity. Oh, and the problem with the beginning of math historically is that they were in control. But see, now I control it because I solicit two or three answers. I have a few students share. Everybody doesn't have to share. Well, in fact, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Every student doesn't have to share. Every student had an opportunity to sh share with a partner, so they don't have to share with the class. I have felt beholden to have 27 students share their ideas when 23 of them have said the same. Better yet, every solution doesn't have to be explored. In fact, some solutions I might not want to explore. It's possible Brooke will give me an idea that, though brilliant, is going to sidetrack the rest of the class. Or, in other cases, Robert might say something that, well, students fall into, and it's a solution that only he can think about because of the way he has posed it or arranged it. Or, more importantly, it's a misconception that I don't want everyone to pick up on. Oh, and every prompt doesn't have to be offered. That's where we take control. You saw three number lines for that activity, but if I only get through two in five or seven minutes, then I only get to through two that day. The point is we control the first few minutes of math. So is that the end? Well, not the session, definitely, but this is a different routine. The arrow now is pointing to three and 45 hundreds. What do you think are the endpoints? I'll give you a moment to think about it.
So after you had a few moments to think about it, oh, and <laughs> the first time you do this, your students are going to complain that you broke the number line, that you can't do that, that you have to have points on the end. Um, well, that's not true. That's where you show them your teacher badge and say, hey, I can do whatever I want. Well, maybe you don't say it like that. But nonetheless, what did you think about? What are some endpoints? How many of you in the audience are trying to figure out what twice as much as three and 45 hundredths was so that you can make endpoints of zero and six and nine tenths? Yeah, me too, the first time. Because I was trained that endpoints have to be zero and something. How many of you thought about the endpoints being three and 44 hundredths or and three and 46 hundredths? How many thought that the endpoints could be one and 45 hundredths and five and 45 hundredths? Because now the interval's two. How many of you thought the endpoints being three and four tenths and three and five tenths? I guess the point is I can go on and on, but if we want students to think about numbers flexibly and in lots of different ways, well, we need routines that do that. These first couple of routines have really only been about relationships and reasoning. If you get a chance to check out the book or some of my other work, you'll see that there's all types of routines for estimating operation sense and so, so on. Hopefully we'll get a few moments to look at those as the night goes on. Oh, look, now it's negative 13. Could it be negative 12 and negative 14? Where would they go? Could it be zero in something? Well, of course. Could you have a positive integer and a negative integer on this number line? Oh, fractions are a perfect opportunity. And in time, just like the other routine, the error shifts so that the endpoints themselves aren't static. This routine is called, is this the end? And again, it's a number line based routine for working with fractions, integers, decimals, even whole numbers, regardless of the grade you work with. Students need practice thinking about how numbers are related. Imagine if I had an expression in the middle, something like x plus seven. What could the endpoints be then? What if I said the midpoint was four times six? Would four times five and four times seven be legitimate endpoints? Really, the opportunities are in this. And that's my point. Please modify, that's the best part about it. If you do the same routine for a month, you are, well, questioning your judgment, I'm sure. And students start to learn to disengage and because they get bored, right? So you have to modify and play with it and think about the ideas that you wanna develop. You need to have an arsenal of different routines too so that you can mix it up every few days. You wanna practice different ideas. In fact, you wanna take advantage of your students and help them help you create prompts and create prompts and well, possible solutions. You want routines to be quality practice. All right, well, maybe you've seen me talk about this before. That's our daughter when she was in sixth grade. And that's our homework. If you look closely, you'll see that that's just terrible. So I don't know, it's maybe 18 digits divided by two digits. And she had 10 of those and I told her not to do it. And <laughs> that's why she's grinning because see, her mother taught at the same school that she went to and said, you can't tell her not to do her homework. and. I told her it was dumb. Don't do your homework. That's not worthwhile practice. So ultimately, we had an argument. She did her homework and I slept on the couch. But there's a bigger point. Practice needs to be quality, right? And 15 of those or 10 of those, that's not quality practice. Routines are actually an opportunity for quality practice to develop number sense. Quality practice needs to be a variety of tasks and experiences. And that's why, if you look, there, well, there are lots of different routines to start math class with. Practice helps kids, students become more comfortable and flexible with an idea. Practice emphasizes fluency. And I'm not talking basic facts. I'm talking fluency, fluency with number, fluency with computation and, and reasoning. But practice can't be mindless drill. In fact, that causes somebody to fall out of love with math. Mindless drill causes students to rely on rote memory as opposed to understanding and thinking. That's right, thinking. In fact, lengthy drills and arithmetic stat, or algorithmic skills uh, tend to diminish flexibility and reflective thought. And again, it go back to that idea of how one falls out of love with math. How about another routine? Choose one of the rectangles or squares and determine how much of it is shaded. I'll give you a moment and we'll come back together in a moment.
So it turns out the fractions aren't the study around food and shaded parts. Well, maybe they are in this case. Um, we're going to talk about the square on the left side. What's a good estimate? Would you say that your fraction should be more or less than a half? How do you know? Do you have an exact solution? What might it be? Does anybody want to share a solution? I heard somebody say 118. I heard somebody say 124. Could those both be reasonable? How did you find it? And so at this point, students might share things like, well, they thought about one triangle being half of a square. And then they pictured nine squares making up the greater square, which means there's 18 triangles in the greater square. And one of them being shaded is 118. What do you think somebody saw if they thought about 124? Is it possible that they saw more triangles? How could they see more triangles? And so these are the types of questions I would ask as we facilitate a conversation about, um, well, about these shapes. I'll show you some more shapes in a moment, but they don't always have to be precise. There's some other thinking that might be involved. I might pose three squares like I did on the screen right now, but in the interest of time, I might only have opportunities to talk about one, and that's okay because I control the first few minutes of math. I can then use the next two on the following days. I could change this to be a question about percentages. How did you think about it? Look at the rectangle square on the far right side. Would you want to think about the amount shaded or the amount unshaded? And how would you use the amount unshaded to determine the amount shaded? Many of my students didn't realize you could think about fractions in such ways. Estimate the shaded amount of the figure. And then we're not going to work on this one right now. Look how I modified it. Mr. Ash, are you talking about the blue or the diagonal? Yes. Are you talking about both the blue and the diagonal? Yes. I want you to engage and think about it. How does that little corner of a triangle impact the rest of the rectangle? Did you see three or four rows? Could you have two different fractions to describe the amount shaded? Why? Another example, and well, here's some more. And the best part about this routine is that really you don't even need to create something on PowerPoint. You can simply draw a picture, shade some of it, draw a shape, shade some, and ask kids to estimate what they think. They can work on partitioning or working different ways, and you can ask them to create them for you. I think one of the nice things about this routine is it helps kids see that fractions are related to, to benchmarks and they're related to parts of the whole. In fact, if you look at the screen right now, I might ask some classes, the whole is just one of those squares and other classes I might ask to say that the square is all of those, excuse me, the whole is all of those squares. Routines have other impacts as well. And I know many people say, well, you're never going to have to do any of these things on a test. But I argue you think on every test. In fact, students who have well-developed thinking, reasoning, and number sense do really well on tests. In fact, they can be twice as fast as those who have memorized algorithms. And when you think about the distractors and how distractors on multiple choice tests take aim at students' misconceptions and miscalculations, kids who think are more likely to be successful. In fact, students who practice thinking are much less likely to fall for those errors. They're, well, also likely to be more, well, speedy in their responses simply because they see that three of the numbers aren't even possibilities or maybe two of the choices aren't possibilities. And so then they need to attack only two. But I think the most important part is that the more I work with number sense and reasoning, the more I see that I can do or I can be a mathematician, the more confident I am about my own thinking and that I'm not trying to get somebody else's answer, but instead I'm trying to develop my own reasoning. These things, well, practice of thinking in general, improve student accuracy. So, will it be more or less than five? Take a moment to think to yourself.
And so how many in the class thinks that there's more than five? How many think it's less than five? And so I get a quick synthesis of that. And the next question I have is how many people found an exact solution and how many just reasoned about the atoms themselves? And so some students will be pick, quick to point out that it's just four and four tenths. Whereas another student might say, well, three plus two is five. So therefore something less than three plus something less than two must be less than five. And that my friends is how we develop reasonableness of calculation, reasonableness of answer. I might add up to find the difference, right? Take five away. And these are just some very simple, straightforward examples to get started with this routine. But as I'll show you in a moment, the possibilities are endless. And though I'm featuring decimals right now, I think you can figure out that whole numbers, integers, fractions, all are good options for this routine called, well, more or less. How many times has option D for your students tripped them up and they give an answer of 54 and something? How many times have they not recognized that it's just a little bit less than four and five tenths because, well, they didn't even add one to three and five tenths. Maybe your students are really strong with addition and subtraction. So it looks something like this instead. Will each be more or less than 50? Why don't you take a moment and focus in on B? So in the classroom, is it more or less than 50? How do you know? And so we have some smatterings of less than, we might have some smatterings of more than. Convince me, how do you know? And so students might talk about, well, 10 times five is 50. Four and 99 hundredths is pretty close to five. Does that proximity to five make up for the fact that it's less than five? Does the fact that 10 and 25 hundredths is that much more than 10? make a difference. What would be a good estimate for that product? Take a look at D. Would 50 and 5 tenths divided by 9 tenths be more or less than 50? I need my students to reason that, well, it's got to be a little bit more than 50. In fact, it's got to be a little bit more than what it is already because 50 and 5 tenths divided by 1, well, that would be 50 and 5 tenths. So there are more 9 tenths in the dividend. And so we might mix it up in all sorts of ways. We might start to work with division. And as you can see on the screen, we might take a look at, you know, take a swipe at integers. Working with integers is more than just memorizing roles and steps and procedures, right? We need that reasoning to, well, make sure that our solution makes sense. And if you take a look, which of those would be less than or more than negative 20? How do you know? It's not that I want really complex computations in these situations at first. So I want my kids to reason why negative 19 and one more would be more than negative 20. So the directions for more or less are included here. I want to share just a few more ideas with you and then wrap up our time together tonight. You see, all of these routines help support effective teaching practices. They, well, they are tasks that promote reasoning, as you've noticed. They are opportunities for meaningful mathematics discourse. I have an opportunity to pose purposeful questions as we go through those. In some of those situations, they will be, well, they will be a struggle for students, and that's okay. They allow me to gather evidence of student thinking. And what they can do is help students develop procedural fluency, not in how they work with procedures per se, but in determining the reasonableness of those, those procedures. Um, these effective teaching practices are critical to our, to our craft and the routines support many of them. But it's not just our practice, it's our students' practice as well. Routines, well, there are opportunities for students to make sense of problems and persevere. Throughout the evening, we've reasoned quantitatively. We've had to construct arguments. In some cases, we've modeled with mathematics. We might think about when is it a good idea to use tools? And so some routines do that, though I haven't been able to feature those tonight. 
having number sense helps us attend to precision. We look before and make sense of structure throughout. And there's opportunities to see the regularity and repeated reasoning and try to extend um, those situations. One more before I close. This routine is called What It Takes to Make. It's also one of my favorites. What you do is you give students a collection of values, such as integers here, and then you ask them to create some expressions that satisfy the prompts. So choose two of the numbers above to find the greatest difference or a difference greater than 60. To find a sum within 10 of zero. To find a quotient of about two. I'll shut up, you work. Okay, so let's maybe talk about the first bullet point and we'll ignore the typos because we're all friends here, right? <laughs> Could you find a difference greater than 60? What, what values did you use? And so collecting those expressions from my kids and then talking to them about, well, how did you make your decisions? Offers a great window into their thinking. What I might hope to see from some of my students is that um, a difference greater than 60 might be 47 in any of the negative numbers. Well, why is that? Well, Mr. S, I thought about the difference between those two points on the number line and the difference between those two points. And well, it would automatically have to be more than 60. In fact, I could use negative 60 in any of those positive numbers to find that. Oh, interesting. Anybody have an expression for a quotient of about two? And again, the opportunity for kids to think, pair and share, and then for us to, well, discuss their reasoning throughout that. What it takes is a routine to, well, think about results. What does it take to make a product between 50 and 80? A number that is 75% more than another. A sum of three numbers within one of 20. And so as you can see with these three bullet points or prompts, I control the time because, well, frankly, we might not talk about all of them. Well, we might only talk about one. We might talk about exacts, but hopefully we talk about estimates. We reason how sums interact with these numbers and integers. And we think about how we create small differences. We might work with fractions. We might start with like denominators. We might decide to skip fractions. What it takes to make. We create a set of numbers and we provide three prompts. A nice opportunity for this routine is to, well, give students a set of numbers and have them create three prompts. Cherry pick the prompts you like the best and use them later in the week. This routine, what it takes to make, is one of, uh, well, 20 routines shared in daily routines to jumpstart math class. Which is where I want to close with you tonight and I'll be happy to take some questions. Daily routine to jumpstart math is um, a collection of 20 distinct routines for middle school, six to eight. And we also have a 912 product, our, our book as well, excuse me. Um, but they can be modified for any grade. In fact, in the, in the book, there are modifi modifications for each routine. So you have the focus routine and you have eight modifications of it. We talk about what students might do during the routine. We offer questions that we might ask. And I think one of the most helpful um, assets is video clips of real teachers doing real routines with real kids to see how one might be set up or managed or incorporated into the daily opening for mathematics class. It's intended for us to take control of the first few minutes of math class. It's intended for us to, well, do something about their number sense and their reasoning. It's intended for us to rethink the first few minutes of math or the last few minutes of math. It's intended for us to help our students, um, well, have opportunities that maybe we didn't have. My email address is on the screen. That's my Twitter handle. And um, thanks for spending some time with me tonight. I look forward to answering some of your questions in a moment. Um, I just want to reiterate that I've struggled with losing time in class and 
students not having the number sense and reasoning that I desired. I was fortunate to do fortunate enough to do something about it, and I encourage you to think about it as well. Thank you. John, I have a couple of questions if you're interested. I am. Here we go. How would a teacher go about getting buy-in from the administration to use number sense concepts in their math courses? Oh, well, I think they can do it in a couple of ways. The best way is after doing it for a few days, invite the administrator in and see how 27 students are engaged in thinking about rigorous mathematics. If an administrator doesn't buy into that, I really don't know what, what, what would, but I think some other things are to have conversations about you know, our students need to be thinkers and reasoners and, and that students who do those things um, perform better, um, not just in mathematics, but, but in general, and that this slice is a better use of the student's time um, and it, it has long-term benefits. But I think the number one way is to, well, do them, get good at them, and then invite an administrator in to see them. And this is sort of this this sort of relates to the last question. Have you ever received pushback from other teachers when asking them to use these number sense concepts in their classes? Yeah, I think from time to time you do get pushed back and that, that's totally acceptable. Uh, in terms of, um, sometimes we're afraid what we're uncomfortable with. Um, sometimes we have a way of doing business. Um, and so I think one of the responses that we often uh, give to, to pushback is that if your students are in a great place and they don't need practice with these ideas, then maybe it isn't for you. Um, if you haven't wasted math time or haven't lost control of math time, maybe this isn't for you. Um, but I think the other thing is is to hook those those teachers that are looking for something new, something to to um, get their kids engaged from the get, um, and then use um, help those teachers have colleagues see the benefit. Thanks. And last question: Do you know of a bank of images, picture perfect images, like you showed at the beginning, that? <laughs> someone could use in their class, you know, where they could find the bank of those types of images. Outside of daily routines, the jumpstart map, no, I'm playing. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I, th I think uh, I'm gonna shameless just to, to go to Google images and look for things. I think that it, it's really important to help kids see math all around them and, and more for as teachers to see it as well and snap pictures quickly when we see something in a classroom. In fact, I was just doing a session around these ideas with a few teachers. Um, in Missouri and they at lunch were snapping pictures um, in parking lots in the restaurants and um, I guess my point is is that math is all around us so those pictures are well all around us. Terrific thank you very much that's the end of the questions um, we can turn it over to Margaret are you jumping in Margaret? I am here hi thanks Jeff and thank you, John, that was great. Um, you really shared some practical and engaging ways to jumpstart math class. As a, re as a reminder, John has two new books, Daily Routines to Jumpstart Math Class, middle school and high school. But as John said, a lot of them can be applied to the younger grades. They're available on corwin.com with an everyday educator discount of 20%. And John is also available for professional development at your school or district. We will be sending a follow-up email in a few days with a recording of this webinar, as well as a PDF of John's slide and a certificate of completion. Thank you once again, John, and thank you everyone for participating tonight. Thanks, folks. Have a great night.